Uh, my name is Greg. I serve on the developer evangelism team for a company called Twilio. Um, first off, thanks so much for being here. I just know it's uh, in the afternoon on the second day of a conference. There's been a lot of great talks. There's several others going on now. It's kind of dreary outside. It would have been really easy just to stay home today. So thanks for coming and, and thanks for coming here. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you uh, know of Twilio? He heard of Twilio? Great. Uh, who, who here has used Twilio before? All right, very cool. So. Uh, Twilio is uh, historically known uh, for making it really easy for developers to send and receive text messages and place and receive phone calls. And that's typically happened more on the server side, uh, you know, because phones can already send and receive text messages, place and receive phone calls. Um, but in the last year or two, we've released uh, several uh, SDKs for Android that add a bit of functionality. So uh, one would be programmable chat. So if you ever wanted to build cross-platform chat, uh, we have SDKs for JavaScript, Android, iOS. We handle like, all the saving of message history, syncing state, typing indicators, et cetera. Uh, we have video calling. We have the ability to do uh, voice calls with the phone network uh, directly from your phone. So you could turn like a tablet into a phone. Uh, we just launched Sync, which you can kind of think of it as like the data store that's powering chat. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about Authy, which is uh, a set of APIs and SDKs for adding two-factor authentication or a second factor, second authentication factor uh, to your apps. And we're going to talk about how you can build customized and better uh, two-factor authentication experiences in your Android apps that you're already building. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why you might want to do such a thing. Uh, but I'm sure that all of you are here in this room uh, because you have at least some inclination of the importance of, of two-factor authentication. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But that happens because there's all these, you know, it seems like every week we're hearing about another attack that happened. We always hear about it after it happens, uh, but in prep for this talk, I, I was doing some Googling, and I found this documentary uh, that actually captured one of these hacks in real time, uh, which is pretty great. Uh, this is my favorite part's coming up here in just a second. She's obviously not typing fast enough, right? And so the, uh, the guy, of course, just goes ahead and jumps in on the keyboard. And they do a little pair of programming here uh, to uh, do it. And I don't want to ruin this for you, uh, you know, like, spoiler. Um, if you're going to, you know, want to go catch up on this later on. But, uh, um, you know, the Luddite comes in and just unplugs the machine because, of course, it was just that one machine that was getting hacked uh, and nothing residing uh, in the cloud. And he saves the day. Um, but uh, in this talk, we're going to cover uh, three points. So one is why two-factor authentication is absolutely essential. It's really easy to think that it's just something you can add in later, that it's something you can add in once you hit a certain scale. Um, and it's typically not you know, the thing that your customers are paying you for. And so it's typically not, it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of urgency around adding it. But we're going to talk about why it needs to be baked into your apps from the beginning. Uh, two, we'll talk about why SMS-based two-factor auth is insufficient. And three, we'll talk about better ways to do two-factor authentication, including ways to build native 2FA experiences into your Android apps. So point one, uh, two-factor authentication is essential. Uh, I want to start off by reading just a snippet of this article, this guy named Matt Honan. He is a journalist. He is M-A-T on Twitter. And uh, a few years ago, some uh, hackers thought it would be fun to commandeer his Twitter handle. Uh, so he says, that at 4.33, someone called AppleCare claiming to be me. Uh, Apple says the caller reported that he couldn't get into his me.com email, which of course was my me.com email. In response, they issued a temporary password, despite his inability to answer the security question I had set up. Uh, and all they had to do was supply two pieces of information that anyone with an internet connection and a phone could discover. At 4.50, a password reset confirmation arrived in my inbox. I don't really use it, I rarely check it, but even if I did, I wouldn't have noticed because the hackers immediately sent it to the trash. They followed that link to permanently reset my Apple ID password. At 4.52, a Gmail password recovery email arrived in my me.com email uh, mailbox. Two minutes later, another one arrived telling me that my Gmail password had changed. At 5.02, they reset my Twitter password. At 5 o'clock, they used iCloud's Find My Tool to remotely wipe my iPhone. At 5.01, they remotely wiped my iPad. At 5.05, they remotely wiped my MacBook. And around the same time, they deleted my Google account. At 5.10, I placed a call to AppleCare. 
And at 5.12, they posted a message to my account on Twitter taking credit for the hack. So there's a, a couple things that are uh, interesting about this. And one is that the hackers didn't, this was not a technically sophisticated attack at all. He mentions that they only needed to supply two pieces of information in order to get a password reset on his Apple account. Uh, and those pieces of information were his billing address and the last four digits of a credit card that was on file with them. Any idea how you go about getting the billing address of a technically sophisticated uh, or you know, technically you know, affluent, uh, I don't know, let's just say technically sophisticated user? Yeah, <laughs> that, that gets you there often. Any other ideas? Yeah, you just run a who is on a domain that they own. Run a who is on, and there's a good chance that their billing address is going to be there, right? But that doesn't give you the last four digits on their credit card. So what they do there is they go into Amazon, and they call up Amazon and say, hey, I'm locked out of my account. Amazon says, okay, well, we need your billing address. We need the last four digits on your credit card. They didn't have the last four digits, so they hang up. They hit redial. And they say, hey, I need to add a credit card to my Amazon account. Well, sure, there's, why would you need to authenticate someone to do that? Like, what's the harm in adding a credit card? So they give them the number of a, say, gift card. Then they hang up, they redial again. And then Amazon says, okay, in order to reset your account, we're going to need your billing address, last four digits of credit card. They give the last four digits that they just added. Amazon resets their password. Now they're in. They can see the last four digits of every credit card that's on file. So they take that, they call up Apple. They reset the Apple password. And then with that, that was the backup address on the Gmail password. And so then they, they on the Gmail account, and so now they can reset the Gmail password. And from Gmail, if your life is anything like mine, once you're in the Gmail account, you have access to everything, right? Um, and so he goes on in the article to say, all of this could have been avoided if only I had enabled two-factor authentication on my Gmail account. Out of curiosity, how many of you have two-factor authentication enabled on your Gmail account. Okay, so those of you who didn't raise your hand or those of you who are lying right now, uh, if you get nothing else out of this talk, please turn that on. All right, and then please like go through and also add it to your Twitter account, your Facebook account, and just start through the list. Like that's the most important thing that you could pull from this talk. All right, uh, but for those of you who uh, who who are already familiar with that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why. Two-factor authentication is absolutely essential. And the first is that users are really bad at passwords and that they use bad passwords and they reuse passwords. Right? And so this is a uh, list of passwords from one of the, uh, one of the you know, dozens or hundreds of, of you know, public hacks that happened this year. Uh, 170,000 people use either 12345 or the much more secure 123456 as their password, and another 40,000 use the word password as their password, right? And again, even if they were using strong passwords, there's a really good chance that it was not a unique password. Using, uh, you know, password wallets or, or something like 1Password is not a common practice amongst folks who don't uh, do this kind of thing for a living, right? Uh, who aren't in, you know, going to tech conferences necessarily. Uh, second problem is that companies lose passwords all the time, right? And so we just have to go back to last week and, or the after party last night uh, for a big story uh, of, of this happening. Um, 500 million account credentials were leaked, uh, uh, and we didn't find out about it for two years, right? And just to put that in perspective, there's 250 million adults in the United States. All right, so, so two accounts for every adult in the United States. Uh, of course, these were worldwide. Um, and... And again, users reuse their credentials. All right? And so there's a good chance that those credentials could then get you into additional sites down the road. And if you ever want to check, if you've never done this before, go to the site, uh, Have I Been Pwned, punch in either your email or your username uh, that you might use across different sites, see where you show up. All right? And you'll probably, if you're like me, you'll find yourself in two or three different uh, one of these. So I think I showed up in the Adobe one. Um, and if you reuse those credentials anywhere, now all those other accounts are vulnerable. So this happens so often, you need to assume that your password has been compromised, right? Um, and in fact, there was one of these hacks that hit the developer community, especially uh, last year, uh, and that was Slack. And 
What was interesting about this is that in the blog post where they announced the hack taking place, there's not even a comma between, hey, something bad happened, and we're launching two-factor authentication in order to prevent this from happening in the future. Right? Two-factor authentication is considered to be like the primary method by which you prevent your, your users from losing accounts, given that users use bad passwords and that they're reusing them, and companies are losing passwords all the time. All right, so passwords are simply not enough anymore for you personally or for the users who are using the apps that you are building today. Um, instead, you need to use multi-factor authentication. And when we talk about multi-factor authentication, we're talking about three different kinds of factors. So one is the something you know, two is something you have, and three is something you are. So no would be like a password, right? Uh, something you have would be a device or a physical object, and something you are would be like your fingerprint, something biometric, perhaps. Um, most people's first interaction with, or, or you know, first exposure to two-factor authentication isn't even necessarily uh, getting a token and getting a, a text from Google. It's pulling money out of the ATM, all right? Because you have a physical card, so that, that's something you have, and then you have to punch in a pen. That's the something you know. But of course, uh, today, uh, oh, actually, who here is like me, uh, like uh, over 30? Uh, all right, so uh, for those of you, maybe earlier in your career, like a decade or so, you might, especially if you had friends who worked for government contractors and whatnot, you probably saw these things. Anyone here have one at one point in their life? Anyone here still have one? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, so these generated time-based one-time passwords. So there was a seed on the device based on the time and the seed. It, it generated a password that was, uh, or generated a pin that was, uh, you know, valid for a short period of time. Right. Um, now, one of the problems with this hardware-based mechanism is that uh, back in 2011, RSA was hacked, the seed database was compromised. And they had to recall the 40 million devices that were in the field and replace them. And it took 18 months to do that. So for 18 months, the people who were owning these devices, if, if a hacker could pair their device with their account, they were able to, to compromise their account. Um, just as a point of comparison, uh, with Authy, last year when we had Heartbleed happen, we didn't think that it affected us. But just out of an abundance of caution, we recycled the seeds on millions of users across all of the applications that are using Authy. It took less than an hour, and the users never noticed that anything was different. All right, so there's great benefits to software-based, uh, um, you know, time-based, one-time passwords as opposed to the hardware devices that we used a decade ago. And of course, today, most people's exposure to two-factor authentication comes in the form of SMS. And SMS has been great for the widespread adoption of two-factor authentication, right? Because it doesn't force people to carry around a physical device. You know, they already have that physical device on them. It's ubiquitous. If you have a phone, then you can get a, a text message, even if it's not a smartphone, right? Um, but it has a lot of flaws. And especially today, when most of the users using your apps, given the fact that all of you are Android developers, which probably means that all of your users actually have you know, smartphones. Uh, SMS is no longer enough. It's OK if it's all that you can offer. Like, it is far better than only requiring a password. But we have such better options today that you, know, you really should not be using uh, simple SMS verification. Uh, so why is that? Let's talk about three re reasons why SMS-based two-factor authentication is no longer uh, sufficient. So first off, it's not always available. So I ran into this last week. Uh, how many of you upgraded to 7.0 on your phones? Uh, how many of you have a Nexus 5X? Anyone? Oh, cool. All right. Uh, there were a select few of us who were fortunate enough to get stuck in a boot loop when we did the upgrade. Uh, so for uh, all of Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, this is what my phone was looking like. Um, I will say Nexus support was really great. My phone was under warranty. They shipped me a new phone, two-day shipping. Unfortunately, I called them on Thursday evening, so I didn't get it until Monday. So for four days, I didn't have a phone. Um, and that means that all of the services that I had SMS-based two-factor authentication only turned on, I could not get into for four days. Right? 
And so, but there's plenty of situations in which your, your phone works just fine and you still can't get that text message. Um, or when it's just really expensive to get it. Dan Kilmer here is the lead solutions architect for Authy. Uh, last week he was down in Bogota visiting uh, our engineering team down there. It was super expensive to get text messages, so he had his phone in airplane mode. But then he went to sign into a service that required SMS, and he had to turn you know, the cell service on. But he couldn't like just say, hey, I just want that one text message from that one person. He got all the text messages that his friends and family had sent him. So it was super, super expensive just to log into account one time, right? Um, there's plenty of other reasons, though. Like you're, if your user lives here, they're probably not going to get your SMS, right? Like if you're ever traveling anywhere in the white space here, like you're not going to get your SMS. If you're ever trying to do work from here, you're not going to get your SMS, right? I even used to have problems getting my uh, SMS tokens here. Uh, just three months ago, I moved to New York from Chicago, uh, and we're like loving it. We live right across the water, wherever I'm turned around. But uh, uh, and it's been it's been absolutely great. We're like so happy to be here. But this is my co-working space in Chicago, and I would have problems getting my tokens because it's in the middle of this building, which is called the Merchandise Mart. It has the second largest building footprint next to the Pentagon of any other building in the United States. So when you're in an office in the interior of the building, I just got really bad cell service. Right? And so sometimes, even at my desk, I couldn't get cell service. And I'm sure a lot of you working in these older buildings here in, in New York have probably experienced the same thing before. So SMS is not always available. Typically, you're going to get the, the token eventually, but it's not going to necessarily show up right when you need it. Uh, second point, SMS is insecure. How many of you all know DeRay McKesson online? So uh, he's one of the, uh, you know, probably the most visible organizer of Black Lives Matter. And in June, this tweet showed up on his feed, which is, shall we say, inaccurate. Uh, he, in, in fact, uh, uh, does not support Trump uh, for president. Um, uh, and and uh, if you want to, to validate that, just go read his feed on any given day. Um, but this showed up. A lot of people were super confused. And just shortly after that, like an hour or so later, he posted this tweet. And the Donald Trump tweet came down. And uh, he says here, uh, at 1031, someone called Verizon impersonating me, successfully changed my SIM, unsuccessfully attempted to change my phone number. Today I learned it is rather easy for someone to call the provider and change your SIM. The hacker got the account verification text. So this attack is called SIM swapping. If you've ever ordered a new phone off the internet and you had to call your provider to say transfer service from one phone to the next, you may have realized that it's pretty easy to do. Like typically they only ask for the password that's on store uh, with your, you know, that's on file with them. And then you can port the service from one phone to another. Like you're not actually verifying that that you own, that you have control of a specific device, you're, you're saying that you can receive text on a specific phone number, right? Um, but that's not the only way that people can intercept these texts. You know, one of the problems is that SMS are sent in plain text. Like anyone who can see that transmission can have access to them. They're also stored uh, in places that are not necessarily just your phone, right? And so uh, AT&T and Verizon both have a message portal where you can sign in. They thought it'd be convenient if you could go and you could view all of your text messages in a browser. Um, but by default, it only requires your phone number and password to sign in. Right? Now, you can turn on two-factor authentication, or you can tell them, I don't want you to save my text messages. But by default, they're on. By default, they're there, which means by default, all of your users have all of their text messages, which means all of your SMS-based tokens sitting that are protected only by their username and password, quite possibly the same username and password that they used on Yahoo. Right. Um, now, there are so many issues with uh, SMS-based you know, two-factor authentication tokens that the National Institute of Standards and Technology, so this is the, the body that makes suggestions, makes recommendations that government agencies are supposed to uptake, makes uh, recommendations that anyone who does business with the government is supposed to uptake, uh, they put out uh, a new recommendation uh, last month that says out-of-band verification using SMS is deprecated and will no longer be allowed in future releases of this guidance. All right. uh, so the government is now saying, for all of the stuff that's important to us, um, we no longer accept this. And one of the reasons for that is easy to look at like someone like DeRay and say, hey, maybe you know, it's just celebrities that it's happening to. The head of the CIA and the head of Homeland Security 
both had their accounts compromised because of similar SMS-based two-factor authentication hacks. All right, and third reason is SMS-based two-factor authentication is just kind of a bad experience. Um, so for all of you who have this turned on, uh, how many of you think it's like you know, a, a decent experience? Uh, how many of you say it's a decent experience for your parents? Right? Like, uh, for anyone else who, who raised uh, your hand earlier and said that you were old like me, like over 30, actually I'm about 36, so um, uh, who, who's noticing like their eyesight's getting a little bit worse? Right? Who's noticing that like your memory is getting a little bit worse? <laughs> Uh, like, I mean, there, there's days when, like, I can't remember the code for, like, the four seconds between, like, looking at it on my screen, and I got to squint a little bit, and then I punch it in, right? Like, uh, has anyone here ever helped your parents set up two-factor authentication? I, I did it over the phone with my dad, and then now it's, like, kind of a pain because whenever he's, you know, has a problem, like, I'm trying to, like, do tech support with <laughs> the two-factor authentications, on, and it's just it's a mess, right? Um, technically sophisticated users, you know, people in our circles, have a better understanding of the threats that are out there, right? But our parents and, and just the non-technical people who are out there, it's, they often underestimate how big the risk is, you know? It's really easy to think something like, uh, you know, I, why would anyone be interested in my email? Like, no one's trying to read my stuff. But they don't understand that when 500 million accounts are leaked, they're just racing against a for loop. You know, the attackers are just cycling through each one, and for every account, every email account they get into, there's a good chance that that's going to lead them to online banking somewhere, right? And so you don't have to be of anyone of importance. You just have to be vulnerable, and pretty much everyone is vulnerable. But because this process, this experience is so bad, people figure that the risk isn't so bad, and, 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 and it's so painful to do, it's just not quite worth it, right? Yeah. I'll take questions afterwards just to keep rolling. Um, so let's talk about a few ways that we can make two-factor authentication much, much better, all right? Um, but first, whenever we talk about this to a room full of developers, we always have to like preface and say, do not roll your own, right? Because it's really, like, whenever, anytime us as developers like encounter a problem, the first thing we think is like, hey, let's just go fix it, right? How hard could that be? Um, so let's start with the first part. You know, all you need to do is like send uh, the, the developer a, a six-digit pin, right? Um, and we, you know, I work for Twilio, and as I said, you know, we're, we're most well known for making it really easy for developers to send and receive text messages. Just like five lines of code, you can send a text. And so we would often have people signing up for our service, and we'd reach out to them, say, hey, why'd you sign up? And they'd say, oh, we're building our own two-factor auth. And we'd reach out to them a few months later. Hey, we noticed that, like, you're not really using your account a whole lot. Like, what's going on? They're like, well, we're still working on it. You know, and, and some of these customers have taken them a year, fortunately, right? Because they had at least encountered the reasons why, you know, the, the things you need to do in order to fix this, as opposed to what some folks do, which is just roll out a really quick solution, like send them a pen, check to see if they typed in the same pen, you're good to go. Most people don't realize that we're not just generating random six-digit pens, right? Like there's actually RFCs out there for the, the ways in which you are to generate time-based one-time passwords. Right? Uh, you need to make sure that, that that algorithm is truly random. You need to make sure that someone cannot brute force that, that, uh, that code. Right? You need to make sure that it expires after a certain amount of time. Uh, and that's just on the code, right? Um, the sending text messages uh, with you know, Twilio is like really easy in the United States. Uh, but that, not all your users live in the United States. And not all your users are always in the United States. You know, they travel. And so we actually just last week published uh, you know, uh, documents for SMS coverage. So this is what you need to know about sending text messages to, I think it's 222 different companies, uh, or 222 different countries, which is great that that info is out there. The downside is, is that across 222 different companies, you need to know something slightly different to reach each of them with an SMS, all right? Um, but more than anything, it's just that security is probably not your business unless, uh, you know, you actually work for a security company. Um, you're probably not getting paid for, by your users in order to build security, right? And you're probably not having a full-time engineer sitting and like monitoring this, making sure you're updating it. Like when we build features, it's really easy to build them, ship them, and then kind of forget about them, move on to the next thing that the customers want, right? But security doesn't work that way. The people who are attacking, you know, who are making these security attacks, they're doing that full-time. Like that is their full-time job. And there's an escalating war. The attacks are always getting more sophisticated. We're always discovering new vulnerabilities. All right? And so in order to combat that, you need to have people on your side working on this full time. And that's probably not 
what you're doing. You need at least one person doing it full time, but now you've put your entire security into the hands of one person and let's hope that they don't you know, get hit by the proverbial bus or, or get disgruntled. Um, so this is probably just not what you, you do not want to, is like one of those things you just do not want to be rolling your own. Uh, so Authy is a company, all they do is text messages. So when we, or all they, no, not, not all they do is text messages. All they do is, is the security aspect of this, right? So uh, when we looked at all of our customers uh, at Twilio who were trying to find, who were trying to build this on their own, we had one customer, Authy, that was doing it, you know, and this was all they were doing, and they were basically like the Twilio of two-factor authentication. Like, let's make APIs and SDKs so that developers can add this functionality into their software and get back to building the stuff that they're actually getting paid to do. And so uh, we acquired, Twilio acquired them uh, last year. And now we're the same company. Um, so super simple. I just put this, you're going to have to write a little bit of server-side code. My guess is that most of you are working on Android apps that is, also has a web-based component, right? And so this is in Ruby just because it's the easiest to, easiest to read. Uh, but whatever language your server-side stuff is built in, there are probably helper libraries for that. And they're just RESTful APIs. So if you make an HTTP request, you can do this. All right, and so very simply, when a user signs up on your website, you just register that user. You pass in the email, the cell phone, the country code, and then you get back an Authy ID and you save that. All right, and then whenever they, uh, like now they're stored, you know, like in their, now they're in Authy system. And so now whenever they need a token, there's three different ways that we can send that token to you. All right, and so the first way that we would send that token is by text message. It is the lowest common denominator. It is a good fallback option, right? Uh, and so this is quite simple. There's just one API call, request SMS. You pass in the, use, the Authy ID. We have their phone number. We send them the, the token. Uh, and then when they punch in the token, uh, you call, make a third API call, verify. You pass in the Authy ID, the token they gave you. Authy tells you, is that token valid or not? If it is, you do the thing. You sign them in. If it's not, then you ask them to try again. Uh, so the upside of this is this method of delivery, this pathway of delivery, is that it's ubiquitous, all right? So you know, it's SMS, uh, and that it does not require them to install an app. The downside is all the downsides that we just covered. It's not immediate. It's insecure. It's not a great user experience. Uh, the second path is Authy soft token. So let me actually show you here uh, just an example of what this looks like. Um, if you're doing anything here, we're going to sign into. Uh, does anyone here do anything with uh, uh, Bitcoin? All right. Has anyone ever had any issues with that, like stuff stolen or uh, no? Okay, well that's good. All right. So uh, what? Let me see here. Let me start on my phone. All right. Cool. So you can see I got this push notification when I went to sign in here to, to Coinbase. Uh, I got a notification. It opens up the Authy app, and there's my token on my phone. All right. And so now I just punch this in here. But one of the nice things about this delivery mechanism is that we can install it on multiple devices. So we can also put this on the Authy uh, desktop app. So I'll use my password to sign in here. And I can come down to Coinbase. And I can see that I also have a token there, right? Now you notice that these two, different to these two tokens are different. So the reason for this is that they're both operating off of different seeds. So if I lose my phone, I can then unregister my device from Authy, and this phone can no longer generate secure tokens. But I still have my laptop. So if the services that I was trying to interact with over the weekend, you know, when my phone wasn't working, we're using Authy, and I had signed up, you know, and added my account through there, I still would have been able to sign into them. This is valid across multiple devices. Uh, so I can copy this code, paste it in if I make the deadline, and I can sign into Coinbase. Now. Uh, for a lot of folks, does anyone here have a Coinbase account? All right, you were the first to raise your hand, so you get some money. Uh, uh, let that be a lesson to all of you. What's your email address on Coinbase? Uh, Jason Hartley at Gmail. All right, Jason, like that? Yes. All right, at Gmail. All right, here you go. Here's five bucks. Uh, we'll put that USD. <laughs> we're going to send funds. And now Authy is going to say, enter your authenticator's two-step verification code, all right? So we typically think of, uh, of authentication as something that only happens on sign-in. 
but there might be actions that happen inside of your app where you also want to make sure that you're verifying you know, that somebody just didn't walk up to a computer that was already signed in. Right? And so money transfers are a really good place to do this here. All right, so that's the soft token. So basically, we are delivering the soft token, uh, like the same sort of pen that we were doing before, um, but we're just doing it inside of an app. That app can be on multiple devices. That app is secure because it, you know, when it's in the air, it's encrypted. Uh, and it is immediate. If you have access to Wi-Fi, if you're on the internet, then you're going to get that token. right? And so there's a lot of times when you have access to internet, but you don't have access to the cell network. Okay. Um, the downside is that it requires installing a separate app. All of you are Android developers, so you probably have apps in the wild that your customers are using. And you, they may not want to install the Authy app in order to access your server, right? in order to access your web stuff. All right, so the third solution here is something called Authy One Touch. And let me show you two different examples of One Touch. So the first will be zesty.io. Uh, and I'll just sign in here. And it's going to come up, and it's going to ask me to enter my two-step verification code. Uh, but we can see that here on my app, I also got another uh, request. And my app's just saying, hey, someone's trying to sign into Zesty. Do you want to approve or deny? All right, so if I just hit approve, then you can see that I was successfully logged in here. All right, and so this uses WebSockets on the server side and it's listening to see if a button was pressed here. When the button's pressed, it pings Authy. Authy then, via WebSockets, passes the confirmation over to the server side, which signs me in. So there's no copying a code there. Right? There's no squinting. There's no typing it in. There's no mistyping it. There's no getting nervous by the, 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 you know, the detonating bomb clock. Uh, you just hit a button, and you're good to go. Um, but this method actually still has the downside that you have to install a separate app in order to use it. Uh, and so just recently, we uh, launched a public beta of the Android SDK for Authy OneTouch. Um, and so we have this demo site up here, and I'm going to sign into it. And when I sign in, it's going to ask me to authenticate. All right. And instead of, let's pull this back up here. Instead of going to the Authy app, I'm going to go into the Owl Gaming app. So this is a separate app. It's just a custom app. And I see an authentication experience in there. And I hit uh, that I want to go into that. And I just hit Approve as well. And then I'm approved. I'm signed in to the site. And then similar me method, let's say this was a game site and that you wanted to approve all purchases. We could do the same thing and then say approve different actions that happen in there. And again, it's just with the push of a button. All right. So in order to do that here, uh, and we have documentation on this. If you, uh, I'll give you the email to subscribe to the public beta. We just have to flip a feature flag on your account if you'd like to try this out. Um, but you first, there's just really five steps that you need in order to do this. Once you add the Authy SDK, you just have to uh, you know, first initialize it. And then you register your device the first time that uh, you know, your user uses that device. You just need to register it as a trusted device. And so in this case, both the, your custom app and the Authy app would be considered separate devices. So that's a one-time thing that you have to do. Uh, and then every time your app starts, you have to sync it with uh, Authy. And this is in part to get the clocks to match up so we know that the, the time-based one-time passwords are, are accurate. Um, and then you list requests. So this might happen every time someone opens your app or switches over to a certain uh, you know, screen on the app. And you list the request to see if there's anything pending. Uh, and then you either approve that request or you deny that request. And, uh, and so the upsides here is that we have improved the user experience because now they're just pushing a button. Um, this is happening inside your own app. So you can fully customize that experience. Like the one we just showed you looked a lot like what the actual Authy app looks like, but there's no reason it has to. Like you could do whatever you want there. As long as you have a button that says approve or a button that says deny, you're good to go. Uh, another added benefit of this that makes it a bit more secure is that we have that deny button. So when you get that SMS on your phone, like there's typically not this like warning if, if that never gets entered into the website, right? But if you actually hit that deny button, then that's a signal that like, hey, something's going on right now. Like I just got an authorization request and like I didn't ask for that. And so you can, you can figure out and, and determine how you want to respond to that because Authy will pass that information back to you. 
Um, and then, of course, this is just a custom user experience. And, so, and this is happening inside your app, so it feels like it's something that's more a part of your actual app, your experience. And as developers, we often want to control every aspect of that customer experience. And this gives you the ability to actually do that. Uh, the only downside, really, is that you have to write and maintain some extra code. Right? But I, I can't imagine. It's like too scary for you, but it does require some extra effort on the part of the developer. And so one nice thing that you can do is set up Authy, rely on the one touch, rely on the Authy app to get it up and running. And that can always be a fallback. And if for some reason that doesn't work for your users, you can always fall back to the SMS. And then you can, at your you know, leisure and discretion, add the custom features to your app as well. All right, so just to recap, two-factor authentication is absolutely essential. Like super, super easy to think. Like it's just something we can punt on, something we'll deal with when we're bigger. It is trivially easy to integrate it at the beginning of your development, so long as you use a service and don't try to roll your own. Uh, SMS-based two-factor authentication is simply just, you know, even though it's the way that most of us experience it, it's just not sufficient anymore to really keep your users safe. Uh, and using you know, Authy SDK using Authy APIs, uh, it can be a much, much better experience than what your users are already used to. Uh, so if this was interesting to you, uh, you can drop an email to Authy Beta, Authy-Beta at Twilio.com, um, and we'll get you signed up for this program and give you the docs, we'll give you the SDK. We really love some feedback on it, uh, the things you like, the things you don't like about it, um, before we roll this out to everyone. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you can email me. I'm gb at twilio.com or at Greg E.B. Uh, and one last thing, uh, it is election season. Uh, and so if you have not yet registered to vote, you can text this number. Uh, this is proudly Twilio powered, 384-387. You can just text hello to it. And, uh, and it, like, I think it's about 10 text messages you trade back and forth. Uh, and you can get registered to vote. Uh, pretty easily there. So that's just a little PS uh, on there. This is important. So I'll, I'll be up here. I'll take questions. We'll let everyone go who doesn't have a question. Uh, we'll also be hanging out at the uh, Twilio booth over in the section for the rest of the day. Uh, it's myself, Josh in the back there, and Dan here. Uh, and uh, would love to chat with you. So thank you all very much. <laughs>